Lately, CPR has been getting more attention for a variety of reasons. So before we start showing you Lucas, I'd like to introduce you to someone you may have already met, Tim Phelan of ECG Consultants. Tim has decades of experience in EMS, he's been a paramedic, and is an internationally known author and educator. One thing we can count on in emergency cardiac care is that the guidelines are constantly evolving and being refined. If you stick around long enough, you can also be sure some things from the past will take on renewed significance. CPR is a perfect example. It's been pointed out that there are three treatments for adult cardiac resuscitation that are unequivocally supported by the evidence. CPR, defibrillation, and oxygenation with ventilation. Two of them, defibrillation and oxygenation with ventilation, have traditionally received tremendous attention. There's always been a lot of emphasis on layperson CPR, but we're once again appreciating the importance of healthcare workers providing effective CPR. So let's talk about what makes CPR effective. Coronary perfusion pressure, or CPP, is the measure of the pressure that drives blood flow to the heart muscle. The heart normally maintains a CPP of 60 millimeters of mercury or more. It turns out that CPR is not just about keeping the brain alive. In fact, our ability to generate adequate CPP during cardiac arrest affects the likelihood of return of spontaneous circulation, or ROSC. One study found that a coronary perfusion pressure of at least 15 millimeters of mercury is required to regain ROSC. This is sometimes referred to as the threshold of survival. This whole issue of coronary perfusion pressure is particularly important with patients who have been in arrest for a few minutes. Here's why. One way to conceptualize the cardiac arrest process is to think of it in three phases. Electrical, circulatory, and metabolic. In this theoretical model, the first three or four minutes is the electrical phase. In the electrical phase, the heart is most likely to be responsive to immediate defibrillation, which is great, just so long as you have a defibrillator readily available. Unfortunately, the more common experience for rescuers is to encounter the patient several minutes into the cardiac arrest during the circulatory phase. It's at this point where the ability to establish adequate CPP is linked to the likelihood of successful ROSC. Beyond the circulatory phase is the metabolic phase. When the patient enters the metabolic phase, the byproducts of metabolism have built up to the point that ROSC is very unlikely. Examples of the role of CPR in improving resuscitation outcomes have been published. Two of them investigated how a brief round of CPR before defibrillation affected survival to hospital discharge. One found among patients with a response time of four minutes or longer, providing 90 seconds of CPR before defibrillation was associated with an increase in survival from 17% to 27%. Another found among patients with a five minute or longer response to their cardiac arrest, their survival rate went from 4% to 22% when three minutes of CPR was performed before defibrillation. Another researcher found that it takes about 90 seconds to achieve the desired increase in CPP. And pausing CPR for, say, the time it takes to switch rescuers causes coronary perfusion pressure to drop, and it takes several compressions to reestablish the previous levels. Given the importance of effective CPR, the burning question is, how well do we do CPR? According to one study, our CPR tends to fall a little below the 15 millimeter of mercury threshold of survival. It's also important to note several studies show the proficiency in chest compressions drops rapidly, often after only one minute. And those studies were done with the older, easier standards. With the new recommendations regarding rate, depth, duty cycle, full chest recoil, minimal interruptions, our task is even more challenging. So here's the bottom line. It's critical to perfuse the heart and brain well during cardiac arrest. The international guidelines for CPR have been modified for just that reason. However, most rescuers have difficulty meeting and maintaining those CPR guidelines. As a result, 
Rescuers everywhere are looking for solutions to improve the quality of their CPR and, in doing so, hopefully improve outcomes for cardiac arrest.